Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Year in Review. As today we talk about some of the recent data sets on colorectal cancer. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Pashtun Kasi, as Director of Liquid Biopsy Research uh, from the uh, Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York City, and Dr. Wells Messersmith, Professor and Head of Division of Medical Oncology of the University of Colorado Cancer Center in Aurora. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by the faculty, just type them into the chat room and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As always, we have a brief one minute survey for you to take before and after the meeting. If you take that, we'll learn a little bit about you. You'll get a lot more out of the meeting. We know a lot of people like to uh, listen to our webinars while they're driving or on the beach or whatever. If you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series including a recent program with Dr. Shah uh, on the management of gastroesophageal cancers. We're getting ready to head out to San Antonio for the 15th year in a row at the Oncology Nursing Society Congress. We're gonna actually do uh, 10 symposia there. All these are gonna be going online uh, for all the nurses who are watching tonight uh, and your colleagues. I'll let them know about this if they're in San Antonio Drop one, to, drop one in, if not, uh, check it out online. We've got 40 different faculty there. Uh, right after ONS, we'll be heading out to the uh, AUA meeting. Uh, we have two symposia there, also uh, will be put out uh, virtually. So uh, Sunday, uh, April the 30th, we're doing a program on uh, urothelial bladder cancer. We did a survey of urology investigators that we're gonna show, and then that night, uh, well, we'll be doing a program on prostate cancer. We're also getting ready to do our year in review program on May the 4th on hepatobiliary cancers, a big adjuvant HCC trial just presented at the uh, AACR this week. But today we're here to talk about colorectal cancer, a lot going on. And as for all our year in review series, I met with each of the faculty individually to record an in-depth presentation uh, on some of the papers that have been presented over the past year. Uh, lots of papers, lots of data, really great presentations for you to check out. Tonight, what we're going to do is really pick out some of the most interesting ones and talk about clinical and research implications as we uh, uh, see how this applies. Uh, here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to start out with a couple of papers from our faculty. Uh, then you can see we have a, a whole bunch of things uh, to chat about. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about all the papers, but really just more get to the top line. But before we get started, I've got to run an idea by you. You know, I get a lot of my thoughts when I'm working out. Yesterday I was working out and I came up with a thought that I want to share with you. And I want you to tell me whether you've heard this thought before. Because, you know, Pashtun, when you did your talk, and one of the things you were going to cover here, our third module, is uh, tumor-informed circulating tumor, tumor DNA. And I was thinking about the data that you went through. And we're going to talk about this in a second. But I just want to point this out for our audience to start thinking about. The more I thought about it, Pashtun, the more I thought about how analogous it seems to be to the use of the 21 gene recurrence score, the oncotype assay in breast cancer, which has been out there for 20 years. Last week, we did a program on a breast with uh, Sarah Hurwitz talking about it. And really, you know, with the oncotype, what it's really done is decrease the amount of adjuvant chemotherapy, you know, de-intensified chemotherapy. And when I thought about where we're going to talk about where we are with tumor-informed DNA uh, patch tune, it seemed to me that at least at this point, that seems to be, I mean, it's a different assay, but from a clinical point of view, it seems like right now the major issue is the possibility of avoiding chemotherapy. So we'll talk about the data later, but I was just kind of curious, uh, patch tune, do you think that uh, Signatera is the new archetype? And have you heard that idea before? <laughs> no, I think the idea is yours, but but I think the I would say on the flip side, it's ready for the escalation part where we have little doubts about what a positive assay means in terms of persistent disease. But I don't think we're ready for de-escalating chemo in somebody that we wanted to give chemo. But yes, in the future, I think that'd be the ideal goal to limit the amount of people who would need chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. 
Any thoughts, Wells? You know, I was just kind of thinking about it from the point of view of the oncologist, trying to kind of get a grasp of what the clinical implications are. And yes, you know, we, we're going to talk about the fact that we know a lot more data is coming, but any thoughts about uh, sort of the clinical positioning of it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, circulating tumor DNA is very exciting. For for one, uh, screening, these pan-cancer screening tests will be very interesting. I'm, I'm kind of tired of seeing 30 and 40-year-olds being diagnosed so young, and I, we can't do colonoscopies on all these people. So I think from a screening standpoint, it's extremely important. From a hyper-selection standpoint, so really making sure if you think your patient is RAS wild type, for instance, you can hyper-select and make sure there's, there's not clones that are RAS mutated. And then finally, for what you're saying, I, I, at the end of the day, I think we'll be able to omit therapy in a lot of patients and spare them um, you know, the cost, long-term um, side effects and things. And so I think it's going to be uh, very impactful. It certainly uh, has affected breast cancer because prior to Oncotype coming in, everybody who had a tumor that was one centimeter or greater got chemo, period. And now, mo certainly if they're node negative, even some node positive patients are. And anyway, we'll see w where that heads. So before we get into the papers, the big papers of the year that we assigned you to cover in your talks, there were a couple papers that I saw in your CVs that I just wanted to briefly bring up. We could talk a lot about it. But for, first was this uh, paper, uh, in the JCO uh, Pashtun that you were part of DPYD uh, testing. I think everybody kind of knows the debate that's going on there. Uh, maybe you can summarize what the bottom line was that this panel had. And in particular, I'm curious, are you doing this in your practice right now, Pashtun? Yeah, in, in summary, the, the timing of this overlaps with the uh, like a citizen's petition that led to FDA expanding the uh, label to make DPYD variant risks more explicit. This just happened uh, December 2022. So the position in this paper that we and some of the other colleagues who are actually using the assay argued that uh, with these assays becoming readily available, low cost, quick turnaround, that maybe it is prime time or, or time to reconsider the utility of using these assays in clinic. So that's what you're doing, Pashtun? That's what we're doing. In fact, we're doing panel-based assays, not just for the DPYD, but as the cost of some of these assays has come down, uh, there's actually a lot more pharmacogenomics to the dosing of narcotics, antidepressants, antineuropathy, medications, uh, um, chemotherapy and drug and pharmacogenomics is just one aspect of pharmacogenomics. And some of these are available point of care. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that, you know, this is even available on the 23 Me. So even if you're not ordering it, um, it is also important to understand what are you going to do with the results if your patients um, come for it. And this with the expansion of this label, this is also something that is coming as a recurring question from the patients and caregivers uh, who want to be tested. So the question of is society getting ahead of the science or what do we do here? There's a lot of debate on this topic. So, uh, Wells, uh, second opinion, or are you doing it? I'm not doing it routinely. Um, I, I agree with Pashtun. Many patients um, show up asking about it, and I think it's something that's important to talk to our patients about. But I think there's a number of caveats. Um, I, I'm on the NCCN colorectal uh, panel, and one of the things we've struggled with is the fact that between us, um, we've, we've treated tens of thousands of patients, if not hundreds of thousands of patients with these um, uh, with 5FU, and most of us can't count on one or two fingers how many cases we've seen. Um, whereas if you start altering the dose um, in all of these patients, we, we might have un underdosed people. Um, I think the other issue is that I always worry about is publication bias. So um, there, there are studies, N9741 uh, being an example, where you have to look in supplemental table six to find where the negative data was showing that there was no effect of DPD uh, variance in that study. Um, and you know, you tend to see this sort of publication of positive studies early on and we'll just have to see how it works out. I, I wouldn't be surprised that as these tests get uh, faster, as Pashtun said, as we're doing more panel-based testing, we are doing panels too in pharmacogenomics in our biobank. Um, I think we'll see more and more, but there is concern that you're going to end up dose reducing people, especially the heterozygotes, where it's not really clear what, what dose are we supposed to give them, and are we going to start underdosing people and, and therefore um, potentially not giving sufficient treatment? 
So we could probably do the whole webinar just on this topic, but this is just like a tasting menu anyhow, new papers, and I can never resist great artwork and also new ideas. So I mean, we could talk a lot about this, but can you just kind of comment a little bit, Wells, on what innate immune checkpoint inhibitors are? And there's this trial in progress with Everpasibep, plus Tuximab and Pembrolizumab. What's uh, this all about? Yeah, so basically we're, we're, we're taking immune therapy from the lymphoid um, to the myeloid and, uh, mm. and macrophages. So um, it, these um, cells have these don't eat me signals, which basically keeps a macrophage from uh, phagocytosine uh, and, and killing the cancer cells. And um, these antibodies are meant to block that signal. So it's blocking the don't eat me signal. Now, um, this drug has an inactive FC domain because these drugs can cause anemia. And the, and the initial versions of them that had an active FC domain had some serious problems with anemia. But what they did is they inactivated it so we don't run into that anemia problem. And the other interesting thing here is that we're using um, uh, cetuximab in this case to basically mark the tumor cells for destruction. So we actually, regardless of RAS status, and it was interesting when we put this before the regulators, they're saying, wait a minute, you're gonna, you're gonna give a EGFR inhibitor to a RAS mutated patient. The point being that it's being used as an immune drug, not a signal, you know, not, not trying to block the EGFR signaling pathway. So that, that trial is um, running here at Colorado and a couple other sites. And so we look forward to seeing what kind of results we get. So yeah, maybe a future year in review, and we'll see what it means clinically. So let's start powering through the uh, papers. Again, just to really get you interested to go, go into these uh, two talks where we really get into detail about this. So uh, we'll start out uh, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, review, the ASCO guideline, uh, Pashtun, and you and your talk uh, go through uh, seven key practice questions. So some of these we're gonna deal with later. There are a couple I just wanted to bring out, um, people can check out your talk to really see in depth what's in this really great paper. First, a doublet versus triplet. Any co uh, comments, uh, Pashtun, in terms of what this paper says and when you use uh, triplets? I would say in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell that triplets are coming back in fashion and for colorectal cancer, full FOX CD is not the same as the traditional fulfirinox, the dosing and things that are more tolerable, and we're trying to identify which additional patients would benefit from a triplet approach versus doublet uh, with the rise of young onset colorectal cancer, the right-sided, uh, which biologics to pair, uh, anti-VEGF, uh, RAS mutants, BRAF mutants. So uh, the, the consensus statements kind of talks about these nuances of where you would consider using triplet cytotoxic chemotherapy. What about you, Wells? I hear people talking about just with right-sided uh, tumors and younger patients. Will that get you into a triplet? For me, the, the key issue is um, how, how important is, is response. Um, uh, the triplete study didn't show a difference, but there's been multiple studies before that showed you do get a little bit higher response rate. Uh, there's also been some perioperative trials. So when, when I'm looking for um, sort of response and aggressiveness, I, I do use the uh, triplets and I do tend to combine them with biologics just depending on the setting. So yeah, I mean, patients who need shrinkage for uh, tumor resection might be one uh, possibility. Another uh, topic you got into that I hear a lot of questions about Pashtun is a TMB as an indication for pembrolizumab. There's a pan tumor approval can you comment on what was said here? And also the issue of TMB that's done by liquid biopsy, because we were talking in your presentation about the fact that maybe that's not the same as tissue. What does this panel say about TMB as an indication for uh, pembrolizumab, Pashtun? Yeah, well, pembrolizumab for mismatch superior deficient MSI high tumors, uh, you know, I think it goes without saying it has first line as well as later line approval. For just the MSS, TMB more than 10 agnostic approval on tissue. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, while it has agnostic approval in the setting of GI malignancies and colorectal cancer, it is not necessarily the best of biomarkers uh, and not necessarily something that we would just give single agent anti PD1 blockade for. Um, uh, I think the only indication where a TMB more than 10 and a single agent immunotherapy like Pembro would help is somebody with the pole epsilon or pole E or pole D mutations that are ultra hyper mutated. Outside of that, TMB is not necessarily the best of um, 
predictive markers and the cutoffs. And, and, and to your question and the comment on liquid TMB, uh, as of right now, the liquid TMB is not harmonized. The Friends of Cancer Research and other uh, commercial companies are looking at harmonizing it. I have this simplistic formula of correction that you can pretty much minus 5 to 10 from the tissue liquid TMB, and that's probably what the actual TMB is. Uh, we've seen many patients where a liquid TMB of more than 10 prompted somebody to give immunotherapy. I think that's probably uh, one of the indications that we should avoid considering immunotherapy single agent. So we have to be careful about this marker as a whole, but then in liquid, it is inflated by the current uh, platforms. So Wells, again, uh, you know, an MS-stable disease, uh, what kind of TMB will get you to think about an IO or Pembro, and will you use just an IO or a combination? Yeah, I haven't, I have, it, it, first of all, it seems to be pretty rare outside of DMMR. Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling even to think of a case where, because most of them are TMB low or, or sort of, uh, you know, less than 10. Um, I would say for me, with my, we, we have a number of um, studies, uh, and so it pushed me more towards trying to get them onto one of our uh, combination studies. Um, but I have not treated somebody uh, with TMB greater than 10 with uh, checkpoint inhibitors solely because of that. It wasn't really the, one of the cohorts, Peshtin, if I'm not mistaken, in the original paper. If I'm, yeah, the actual number of GI malignancies uh, were far and few. Uh, in fact, one, that's one of the most debatable agnostic indications because I would imagine agnostic trial would have e some representation across the board, across tumor types, uh, and especially within GI, the number of patients that actually were part of that cohort were limited. So uh, check out Pashtun's uh, presentation. There are a bunch of other things from this paper that he gets into, including peritoneal disease, oligometastatic uh, liver mets. But uh, Wells, you uh, in your talk went through the issue of MSI high and N MS stable in terms of uh, the use of checkpoint inhibitors. Here are the papers that you talked about, uh, beginning with, of course, the very remarkable uh, study looking at neoadjuvant therapy uh, in uh, locally advanced uh, rectal cancer, the study at a memorial, now we even have more people. Uh, anything you want to say in general about neoadjuvant therapy and MSI high uh, GI tumors or really colorectal cancer wells? And right now, how are you thinking that through outside of a trial setting? Uh, it it's such an impactful paper. I mean, it, 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 it's not very common we see deficient MMR, uh, especially in rectal cancer. But if you think about uh, patients who are thinking about a lifetime of having an ostomy, uh, to be able to avoid that and have these just incredible complete responses is just life-changing. Um, and, and with a you know well tolerated drug um, at that, so um, it, it's a real paradigm shift, and I think it's great for patients. And it's been something we've been really excited to see. Um, again, pretty rare though. I mean, I, I, we get maybe like one a year. Uh, we have a pretty big program. Um, you know, in the metastatic setting, obviously, we uh, for MSI high, we have uh, good data there. And what's interesting in the neoadjuvant setting, you know, there's this question, maybe while you have your lymph nodes in place, while the tumor's in place, there's already some inflammation going on. These, uh, these checkpoint inhibitors will have even more um, activity because I, I think uh, Dr. Sersak and her colleagues at Memorial were expecting, you know, to have um, uh, good efficacy, but I don't think anyone's expecting 100%. <laughs> uh, so I, it, it, there's something about having that uh, perhaps about having that immune system in place, uh, no surgery has been done yet, the lymph nodes haven't been removed, maybe that is helping uh, along the lines of efficacy, but um, I'd be curious to see what Pashtun thinks. And also Pashtun, uh, it, I'm also curious what you think about this study, the NISH2 study uh, that Wells reviewed. Of course, Epinevo always comes up, anti-CGLA4, uh, and even though the memorial study was very impressive, this is also a pretty impressive uh, waterfall plot. Uh, so, first of all, any thoughts about uh, anti-CTLA-4, PD-1, and uh, MSI high, either neoadjuvantly or metastatic uh, disease? And have you used neoadjuvant uh, IOs in rectal cancer, Pashtun? Yeah, no, I, uh, I would say yes to all your questions. And in fact, um, as they say, um, imitation is the best form of flattery, we, we opened a trial that's exactly mimicking niche two. Uh, we're calling it Nest One, uh, and we're using the BotBal, uh, the other botancilumab, uh, CTLA-4 re-engineered uh, 
immune checkpoint blocker in the adjuvant setting. It is a question that's coming up more. I agree with Dr. Messer Smith that, you know, colon cancer is not the same as rectal cancer and the uh, a robotic, uh, minimally invasive, right, hemicolectomy in the hands of a colorectal surgeon, you know, patients are going home the next day. So even if you are able to get, let's say, a 100% response by checkpoint blockade, is, is that going to replace the standard of resecting somebody. Obviously, with rectal cancer, you know, uh, that's a different ordeal with uh, skipping trimodality therapy or ending up with a permanent ostomy. There is a subset of patients probably who might benefit, and uh, the patients that we've used it in standard of care, pembrolizumab, are the second peak of the MSI high is in the elderly, where you have the somatic MLH hypermethylation. Um, in those scenarios, if somebody is not medically fit to get an operation for whatever reason, uh, that's where you will find the second uh, peak of the mismatch repair deficient tumors. Uh, you could potentially treat them with... Um, uh, check my blockade and expect responses uh, which have been like uh, Dr. Messer Smith said better, uh, better than expected I, is it the new adjuvant setting where the cancer has not metastasized that's leading to the 100% and the waterfall plots or the chalabi plot as they call this one uh, uh, as opposed to the truly metastatic setting you know there's at least a third of patients who don't respond so uh, Wells uh, Daniel from the chat room has a uh, 57-year-old patient with MMR proficient metastatic pancreatic cancer with a TMB of 32 on tissue, no other positive biomarkers. It is pancreatic cancer, but just vis-a-vis -vis in terms of this issue with TMB and Pembro, uh, Daniel wants to know any role for immunotherapy in second line or beyond in that situation. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting case. I, I And again, I, I just... Uh, it's pretty, I don't even check TMB routinely, although it's usually part of a uh, panel, um, but it would be tempting at the TMB that high. And it does make me wonder about poli or something else um, that might be contributing to that. Although I hear poli like has really high TMBs, but you know, I don't know. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, I think uh, Pashun, you were referring to this uh, new uh, FC enhanced CTLA-4 inhibitor that uh, Wells uh, talked about in his talk, combined with a nut, with a PD-1 inhibitor that is, I guess, not approved by Stilimab. Uh, Wells, like, what is an FC-enhanced CTLA-4 inhibitor, and is it different than you know uh, tremolumumab and uh, ipilimumab? Seems to be. Um, so uh, I have to admit, when I first heard about this drug, I was I was skeptical uh, because basically they put in the uh, I think it's three point mutations in the FC portion to enhance the, uh, the immunogenicity, basically, of, of the, um, uh, or the immune activity of the drug. You can see there they talk about T-cell priming, uh, increased Treg depletion, and decreased complement media toxicity. Um, but it does seem to be different because they're, they're reporting in, in patients without liver meds, you're seeing response rates greater than 40% and MSS colorectal, which is really impressive. Uh, we have the phase one study open here and, and we've treated uh, patients on it. Uh, you're not allowed on the trial actually if you have liver mats. Um, and we've definitely seen um, activity, especially patients with lung lesions. Um, and we'll be opening the uh, randomized phase two as well. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. I, I was skeptical, but I've seen it uh, with, with my own eyes as they say. So yeah, I was all excited about regorafin and nivolumab, but I guess that didn't quite work out, but maybe this will. What about, you know, of course, the anti-CTLA-4 makes everybody think about toxicity. Is there more or less or the same toxicity with this as compared to like ipi and trimlimumab? There's a fair bit of um, GI toxicity. They're seeing fairly high uh, or, or somewhat higher colitis uh, rates, but um, they actually... Uh, instead of steroids, are really uh, pushing to use infliximab and other uh, more targeted agents uh, for that toxicity. And so it is something we're seeing more of, but it's very well delineated in the protocol how to how to deal with it. So I think the audience knows that I'm, I'm a sucker for great artwork. And uh, Patch Tune, when I saw your uh, your talk, I was like, wow, I got to find out who did that. And uh, the artwork is incredible here that, you, that you've been putting out, Patch Tune, a really kind, and this is yours. You, you conceptualize it your, yourself, so this is fantastic stuff. Uh, and you, uh, you know, here's uh, some of the things that you went through in your talk. But um, I want to go back to the papers that you covered and talk a little bit about 
uh, what we know about circulating tumor DNA. I made the, uh, brought up the issue of is this the new archetype, but let's talk a little bit about what we know about this strategy. All, every, all the other solid tumors are looking to colorectal cancer now in, in terms of this strategy, a lot of circulating DNA uh, coming out and outside of uh, colorectal cancer. Can you kind of track out uh, what we've learned over the last few years about this and where we are today right now, Pashtun? Yeah, I think uh, when we were a few years ago, it was more so recurringly a uh, question of bad prognostic uh, indicator. So we had more registry studies corroborating the same. We learned more about positive being something that uh, is always bad and these patients recur. But I think what our understanding has moved now, especially in the last year or so, it's not just a question of prognostic marker, especially with the assays getting nearly 100% specific, it's more so signifying persistence of disease that pretty much you have leftover cancer in your body if you, after curative intense surgery, they, we are detecting CTDNA with some of these platforms. And I guess the biggest landmark paper that you have it at, as the bullet point three, three with Dr. T et al. from the group in Australia, uh, for the first time we have a randomized trial using a CTDNA guided adjuvant therapy, and I would say kudos to the investigators because they started this back in 2015. You know, we were debating about how to use tri it in trials in 2023 for them to pull off a, a randomized multi-center study, and the assay was being done here in one of the labs in Hopkins, you know, so it's, you know, uh, they were able to show that this is feasible, and they were able to show that the recurrence-free survival was not compromised in a stage two setting. And for what it's worth, um, half as many people got chemo to your comment on uh, the oncotype in terms of decreasing the number of patients who need chemotherapy. This trial showed that they achieved overall similar disease-free recurrences with only half as many actually getting chemotherapy. So, uh, but I think where it is right now, the future directions is 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 using it as an integral biomarker in clinical trials. Um, that's we, uh, active tri trials right now, like the Circulate US that's ongoing. There are some post-adjuvant therapies, some novel therapy trials. Pairing this with the right novel drug is the future. So, uh, Wells, any thoughts, particularly about stage two? It really is remarkable, this uh, randomized study that was reported. It reminds me a lot of the, some of the initial, quote, no negative trials uh, that were reported with Oncotype. And as Pashtun said, uh, the patients who uh, had uh, CTDNA done had less than half amount of chemotherapy, but the same overall effect. Has this uh, come into your practice, Wells? Or are you utilizing it in what situations? Yeah, so... Um we, we have both the stage two and the stage three study open. And um, if, if we're going to check it off, uh, basically off of those studies, we just have to be very careful that we have an agreement that we're going to act on the results. That's, that's what I, I spend a lot of time before sending it to make sure the um, patient understands what the test means, the fact that we don't know 100%, especially if it's negative, uh, you know, can we safely omit therapy, although the, the initial data looks pretty good. And what I find, though, it's funny, um, you know, uh, medical oncologists tend to uh, put a lot of weight into small differences. And if you really start going over the number needed to treat to, to see some of those differences with patients, many of them are like, you know, for that tiny little difference, I don't really care. And I'd rather not have to take time off work and have financial toxicity and the rest. So getting a sense of what some of these smaller differences mean to patients um, and sort of going through some of the numbers with them, I think is really important. Um, and it's something that I sketch out with a lot of them. And if we can come to an agreement about what we're going to do, if it's positive, what we're going to do if it's negative, then I'll, I'll send it. Uh, but of course, I, I do encourage them to uh, take part in the studies. Then again, if they're going to just get the test as part of the study and then come off trial and do their own thing. I want to clarify that too, because we don't want to do the study. So I think you, you have to kind of talk through that. And it's funny, I find stage two colorectal cancer um, is some of my longer uh, consults, actually, because it takes a while to really go through this information. And what sometimes I see in the community um, is people send it, you know, because they, the test is being pushed and patients are interested, but then they get a result and they haven't thought about how they're going to use it. And, and now you're in trouble because, you know, especially if it's positive, the patient's sort of really um, uh, potentially upset about it. 
um, and, and you haven't really decided what you're going to do. And finally, I do think we're going to have this new patient population of patients who've completed surgery, completed adjuvant therapy, and yet they're still positive. The question is, what are we going to do with them? Do we keep giving therapy? Do we give them something else? Do we give them immune therapy? I think that's it's going to create a new patient population, which is a good thing because those patients were destined probably to, to recur. So we need to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, it sounds like a great trial. And actually, I was just flashing on the fact that the only scientific presentation we ever did, I actually presented at the ASCO, uh, at the GI symposium like 10 years ago. We, you know, there were all these studies in breast cancer showing there were a lot of women who were willing to go through chemotherapy who'd had it in the past for like a 1% difference in, you know, outcome. So we did the same thing with people with colorectal cancer. And we saw the same thing. There were some patients who wanted to be treated, would have been treated again for just a 1% improvement in, in recurrence rate. And there were others who wouldn't be treated, who wouldn't want treatment even for a 10% benefit. So a lot of heterogeneity. The other thing that was really interesting, we saw no difference in men and women, because people were saying, oh, the women want you know, aggressive therapy. So no difference. Pashtun, where do you see this heading? I see docs thinking about this, for example, stage four NED, patients who've had liver resections, uh, and also the issue of uh, de-escalating therapy for stage three Pashtun. Of course, that's being looked at in trial right now. If you had a patient with one positive node who had an MRD that was a negative, uh, would you at least discuss with the patient the possibility of not having chemo, or is that too far out of standard of care? Yeah, like Dr. Mr. Smith, it, it's taking longer, the conversations uh, in actually the lower risk or the stage two or let's say the low risk stage three. And we, I completely agree, the, the, there's need to spend time as to what are you going to do with the result and how is it going to change the plan. Uh, I would say right now, if the plan is to do adjuvant chemotherapy in a high risk stage two or for that matter, Low risk stage three, uh, I tell patients what the negative assay could mean. So that's not going to change our decision. You know, we might use it in surveillance and follow up or enrollment in clinical trials. But uh, where it might help is a patient where if you weren't planning on giving chemotherapy and uh, there is persistent disease, well, you know, there might be value there in a, in a stage two low risk patient. And then um, the other thing that I've sometimes found helpful is, you know, nobody's too enthused about getting chemotherapy and the blanket statement of everybody with stage three cancer should get some chemotherapy, uh, even though they reluctantly sometimes agree to it. Sometimes I found the CTDNA being positive corroborate or reiterate the plan uh, where that same patient who's hesitant about doing chemo is now all very motivated uh, and uh, wants to pursue it. And, and to Dr. Messerspin's earlier comment, it has also created this new setting, the adjuvant plus setting, uh, where a lot of the clinical trials are actually looking for patients now who are done with their curative intent surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy, but then unfortunately are still have molecular CTDNA positive, but are not yet cured. So this this new pre-stage one, pre-line one therapy or adjuvant plus setting is 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 a perfect platform for clinical trials, um, more frequency of cadence, cadence of imaging, or considering cross-sectional versus functional imaging for finding an oligometastatic uh, as the settings you were referring to. You know, um, if we could potentially identify a solitary liver met earlier on because of the results of the testing, again, those would be great questions for trials, and that's how some of the folks are using it. I was just flashing on that prostate cancer symposium we're doing next week in AUA. And you know, imagine trying to treat prostate cancer without a PSA. I mean, everything that we're talking about there is based on that. And maybe this assay is going to start to bring colon cancer at least somewhere into that arena. Again, congratulations on the incredible artwork here. I really uh, love it. And I recommend everybody uh, check out the, the talk where you go through this. Let's talk a little bit about later line therapy because uh, interestingly, we saw a phase three trial. I was kind of surprised, but gratified uh, looking at something we've been talking about the last couple of years, uh, adding uh, bevacizumab into uh, TAS 102. Uh, and you know, the whole issue of later line therapy, you talked uh, also in your uh, presentation about uh, the new TKI uh, frukitinib. Uh, so first, TAS-102 and uh, Bev uh, Pashtun, can you talk a little bit about the sunlight study and how it's affected the way you think about uh, later line treatment? Yeah, yeah. and the, the, so the sunlight study with the, uh, the typhloridin to um, it's it's something that's 
pretty much, I would say, confirmed clinical practice because since the phase two came out a year or so ago, it has been in the NCCN guidelines uh, that the addition of bevacizumab is something that is a consideration that led to better progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, we, for the first time now at the GI ASCO 2023, uh, saw the clinically meaningful progression-free as well as overall survival differences, and it was across subsets. So it's uh, whether you were RAS mutant or somebody with liver mets or somebody who had prior bevacizumab exposure, the question of bevacizumab beyond progression that we see in earlier lines of therapy is also uh, proving true in the later line setting as well. Um, and um, for patients with colorectal cancer, you know, the advances have been coming in subsets and it's been a continuum of care. We are finding, uh, like for example, this uh, frucutinib uh, oral anti-VEGF TKI probably making its way into as one more option for our patients with uh, uh, refractory metastatic colorectal cancer. So Wells, uh, mind meld with the chat room. Jason asked the exact question I was about to ask you, which is how are you thinking through third line therapy in a patient who gets full Fox Bev, first line, full Fury Bev, second line, maybe it's a right-sided, let's say RAS uh, wild type tumor but what's coming next, uh, Wells? And what about uh, TAS-102 and BEV or EGFR antibody? Yeah, so if, if they're RAS wild type left-sided, I'm going to be doing a, a EGFR probably earlier on. Right-sided, right. I haven't been re-challenging, uh, trying to like challenge a, a RAS mutated or, or right-sided. I know uh, there's some data there, um, and I'll be uh, I'm sort of following that story, but I haven't been doing it. And then um, in terms of continuation, so there, there was definitely more effect. Uh, the, the, um, the forest plot was more impressive for patients who um, hadn't just been on bevacizumab, but, but, the, but it was positive even for patients who had received bevacizumab in the past. So unless there's some toxicity issue or something else, I'll be um, thinking about uh, uh, using it. And we put it into our standard order sets, and it's pretty routine for us now. And as Pashtun said, we put it in NCCN after a phase two trial just to have it there as an option as we awaited the, uh, the uh, phase three trial. Pashtun, any thoughts about where sequencing, if we had frequitinib uh, available, where it would fit in? And, you know, it's, I'm hearing a lot of people saying they're now tasks plus BEV is coming before Regarab. I think people used to think they were kind of equal in efficacy now more with BEV, you know, better tolerated, et cetera. But any thoughts about what's going to come first, Regarafenib or Frucitinib? I, the correct answer is I just don't know, but at the same time, I think it's a good problem. I often don't see them as competitors, but more so as one more option in terms of, uh, you know, for the next trial that my patient would consider or uh, what they might move on to next. Um, I would say, with, especially with the earlier question regarding uh, triplet therapy, you know, rather than cumulative neuropathy from oxaliplatin, this could also be something that could be post-maintenance progression, the TAS-102 plus BEV, that, uh, not necessarily something that's for the last line, but something that's for truly like a third line setting uh, option. and. Uh, with frucutinib, it is a TKI, but I don't think it's regorafenib. Uh, I don't think it's the same. You know, it's a different drug, different mechanism of action. Uh, it would be a value for studies down the line and maybe some of the real-world data to show uh, similarities and differences and whether there is any benefit that's preserved post-TKI exposure. But I, I would say I would just view this as a good problem of having more than one option in later line setting. So anti-HER treatment for colorectal cancer, you know, we started out with breast, then we saw an upper GI, colorectal, lung cancer now are using anti-HER therapy. And Wells, of course, last summer, we saw the ducatinib trastuzumab combination reported in the phase two Mountaineer study. Can you talk a little bit about what they saw and where you think you see this combination fitting in right now outside of a trial setting and where you see it heading in the future? Yeah, so this was a uh, study that started out actually as an investigator-initiated trial uh, with Dr. Stickler, then sort of turned into, as they started to see efficacy, um, then turned into a much larger uh, phase three trial. And it's going to be looked at in the first line setting. This this was in um, later line setting, but it was quite active uh, to catnib, a small molecule, TKI, 
um, in combination with trastuzumab for HER2 positive disease. And um, they saw really nice response rate sort of in the uh, sort of 43% range or so. Um, and impressive progression-free survival. You don't see the flattening of the curves like we have seen with some of our immune therapies, but um, you know, very active um, regimen. And there's a uh, first-line study that'll be um, uh, that, that's going on, so we'll see if it has a role in earlier lines. And the main thing is just to make sure we're testing for this. Um, so if people aren't doing sort of the full um, NGS panel, making sure they're checking her too, especially in the RAS wild type population where it's more common. What about uh, HER2 and colorectal cancer uh, wells? How commonly is it positive? Is that you use the same criteria as with breast cancer? How do you define HER2 positivity? Is it overexpression, for example? Yeah, so, so typically um, you'll, you'll often pick it up as being amplified in an NGS assay. And um, th that, that actually can, uh, looks like it's probably enough. Um, but we do tend to order fish. And as I said, we, we sort of go down an algorithm where especially if they are RAS wild type, you can see HER2 amplification in up to 15% of the cases, depending on what sort of database you're looking at. So that's not insignificant. And it's just important to keep in mind to uh, check that, um, especially in the RAS wild type population. How would you compare indirectly the impact of this combination compared to TDXD wells? We have seen activity in colorectal cancer. Um, any thoughts about the comparison? Yeah, it's a, I've had that question before in terms of how to sequence or you know um, that type of thing, and and um, I think they actually seem to have similar efficacy if you sort of look at response rates. The toxicity is a bit different. Um, and of course, you have that pulmonary toxicity you have to watch out with, uh, with in her too. Um, but um, I think it's uh, we'll have to see in terms of how to sequence them. But to me, you have options, and I tend to use them sequentially. Um, and we'll see if the first line trial is positive, because then obviously that would bump that up into the first line setting in combination with chemotherapy, and then move on the uh, trastuzumab directs to can to later lines. Um, any comments on the tolerability of 2-catinib? Of course, it's been used and it's approved in breast cancer in the so-called HER2 uh, climb regimen, but there it's combined with capecitabine, so it's a little hard to figure out what's usually most people blame the capecitabine for things like diarrhea, et cetera. But any comments about this combination in terms of tolerability, uh, Wells? It's pretty well tolerated. I mean, they, they did see some increased GI, you know, the typical kind of TKI things that you see, but grade 3 was pretty rare. Um, some increased fatigue, um, but, but no, overall, I think if, as you uh, compare it to some of the other combinations of these small molecules and, and uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, it's well tolerated. So any thoughts about this uh, combination, Patch Tune? And I was just sort of fantasizing about the older patient, maybe in their late 80s, comorbidities, you really don't want to give them chemo. Maybe they have low volume, asymptomatic, metastatic disease. Could you ever envision using this uh, combination first line in a patient like that, Pashtun? Yeah, no, and um, I have a positive bias towards it. I was one of the co-investigators with uh, John Strickler on this uh, as the study uh, went from an IIT to a registrational study. And it, as Dr. Messerschmidt mentioned, it's been studied in the first line setting as well. And you know, the, the question of having a chemo-free option was also brought up even in the first-line setting because the, the efficacy and tolerability both are uh, are questions that uh, are, are in favor of this regimen. Um, biologically, on the question of TDXD versus this, um, I guess your RAS mutant patient population, which doesn't benefit from a monoclonal antibody or pastuzumab, pertuzumab, and it was an exclusion criteria on this trial. Uh, one discussion that we've had within our group is maybe that's a patient population where an antibody drug conjugate uh, wouldn't rely on downstream RAS mutational activation that you would consider that. But again, it's more so that most patients end up getting, if you even start with one, it's a sequencing question and they'll likely get exposed to both these combinations over their lifetime. So, Wells, uh, could you imagine using it first line in a patient you don't want to give chemo to, or you think it'd be better to you know somehow get the try to get the patient through chemo? Yeah, I mean, it's with with colorectal cancer chemo. I mean, it's pretty rare we can't 
get make things tolerable with full fox or something else. I mean, you don't even need uh, normal liver tests or things for that. So it'd be pretty rare, but I would certainly consider it if somebody, um, you know, refused chemotherapy, for instance. Um, I would consider that. And, and I, you know, I think most patients, the colorectal population is stable enough, they're probably going to be able to get both the trastuzumab direxatecan and this combination. And it's really just a question of sequencing one versus the other. It is nice, um, you know, to have a chemo-free option and also perhaps a maintenance approach um, over time. And here is the uh, Mountaineer 3 study, the uh, phase 3 first-line study, Pashtun, that you were uh, referring to. Uh, what, what's your experience uh, with tolerability with this uh, combination, Pashtun? Yeah, very minimal issues. Uh, the as 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 if you look at the SAEs, um, there were patients with uh, diarrhea. That was the most cumbersome, but it wasn't like uh, cumbersome in the sense that you need to do anything proactively. Uh, just the usual supportive care. Uh, we've had some patients on it for a very long time. Some of those waterfall patients, uh, the individual bars that are pretty deep, are patients who are years out. So it's. Um, and, the, uh, and it's more so in the, looks like the rectal or the left-sided patient population, even in the Mountaineer study, 90% of the tumors were uh, in the left side and uh, the rectal uh, patient population. So if you were in a country or resource situ limited situation, if you really had to make sure that you don't miss uh, HER2, uh, you're likely going to find most of them uh, in the left-sided colon and the rectal uh, patients with rectal cancer. What about uh, CNS activity? I don't know how many people had brain mats uh, who were in the trial, but of course in breast cancer, that in particular, actually they use the Herclime regimen and hold off on radiation. They're so confident in the benefit. What do we know about CNS activity with uh, this combination of colorectal cancer, Pashtun? You know, we're seeing more patients with GI malignancies um, now that there are ex except, uh, extended survivors. Uh, a, a problem that we weren't used to seeing as often. We're seeing it more often now. Uh, I would say in upper GI, we often have patients who have brain mist to begin with. There's tropism in the HER2 positive malignancies to, to go to the brain. So having blood-brain barrier penetration is, is of uh, crucial importance. Um, this year, we had several patients with cholangiocarcinoma where HER2 is also seen in about 15, 20% of the cases where they've had exceptional great responses to trastuzumab, pertuzumab, but then they progress only in the brain where it's a drug delivery issue where monoclonal antibodies do not penetrate the blood-brain barrier, but uh, both the antibody drug conjugate, TDXT, there's a Nature Medicine breast cancer paper that actually was looking for patients with breast uh, cancer, brain metastases, and the disease control rate was like 92%, uh, extremely remarkable. We recently had a case of a CR with multifocal brain mets from uh, HER2 positive gallbladder cancer. So so in, the, in in summary, both these agents, both the TKIs, tocatinib, as well as um, the antibody drug conjugate, TDXC, they both have blood barrier, barrier penetration. So that's uh, one uh, good uh, issue that these have, drugs have. So not, because uh, having, you know, once you have brain mets, it's a very bad situation to be in. So one less thing to worry about. Any comments on CNS disease, uh, not just HER2 positive, but in colorectal cancer uh, wells? Anything exciting uh, coming along? Yeah, so it's pretty rare. I mean, when I see G, uh, brain mats and GI cancers, it tends to be non-colorectal, like uh, Pashtun said. It tends to be upper GI, you know, your gastric, some cholangios. I had one case of pancreas. Um, I agree. It tends to be in long-term survivors um, and... Um, uh, I think uh, because of the CNS penetration into catnip, if I had a HER2 patient, positive patient with brain mats, it was something I would definitely uh, turn to. Um, but I, I have to say, it is, it's pretty rare uh, to see that in colorectal. So let's talk a little bit about EGFR antibodies. Of course, we saw the big presentation uh, at uh, last year's ASCO meeting of the Paradigm trial. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Pashtun, about the issue of EGFR uh, antibodies and particularly the issue of first-line therapy and what your personal practice has been outside of a trial setting? Yeah, I know this is a debate question, quote-unquote, that comes up in almost every uh, GI or major oncology conference. Um, a paradigm study for the first time provides uh, a prospective randomized trial 
clearly showing a better overall survival benefit. And to Dr. Mercer Smith's uh, earlier point about the utility of CTDNA in terms of ultra hyper selecting the same group just a few months ago presented uh, even better overall survival differences if you refine the patient population to the truly left sided RAS negative, extended RAF negative, and I would throw in the HER2. We were talking about HER2 as a positive actional marker. It's also a negative predictive marker for anti-GFR efficacy. So if you truly limit your patient population to the left-sided, the RAS, RAF, wild type, the HER2 negative, and I'll throw in the CCDNA negative patient cohort as well, the survival differences across multiples of these retrospective exploratory analysis from FHIR3, KELGB. There's a nice NCDB USA data looking at 42 months versus 29 months OS difference. And there's also definitely a better response rate uh, with anti-GFR versus anti-VEGF, which, which can be important um, in some clinical situations where response is a key variable. So I would say, you know, for me, unless there's a, a reason not to use anti-GFR, which I can't think of right now, um, I would choose an anti-GFR preferentially, given now that you have a randomized trial as well, showing better overall survival. So, Wells, I can think of a good reason, which is toxicity. And I think that's why in the U.S. we kind of resisted what we've been hearing, you know, from uh, the Europeans as, and, and others uh, about the idea of using first-line EGFR. Again, Wells, outside of protocol setting, in what situations, if any, are you using EGFR antibodies first line? I, I'm only using it when I need a response. Because the thing about Paradigm and a lot of the European trials is that the patients who get an EGFR inhibitor in the second line setting is less than 50%. And I don't get it. I, I, I mean, I've never, I, don't, I can't think of any patients that I've had with uh, RAS wild type left sided tumors who haven't gotten an EGFR inhibitor. It's like zero. Um, so I, I just don't know how to sort of extrapolate these papers to my practice because um, my, I doubt there would be a survival benefit if 100% of the patients received an EGFR inhibitor in the second line setting as they should have and as I, as I do. Um, and I, I do think the rash can be extremely problematic and disfiguring. And remember, in the first line setting, you're looking at a pre progression free survival of over 10 months. It's uh, shorter in the second line setting. So, you, you know, you're talking about nearly a year of uh, potentially very disfiguring rash. Um, so I, 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 um, I, I tend to be more, I, I definitely talk about it with patients. And when I, when I need the response, it definitely adds response. So I'm looking to shrink things. If someone's symptomatic, I'm thinking maybe I can cure them. Um, if I get more of a response, I'm going to definitely use an EGFR inhibitor. So I use it. But if I have an asymptomatic patient who's doing fine and, and they Google the rash that you get with these things, I'm, I'm not getting a lot of uptake, honestly. And, and the other thing is on the maintenance side, um, you know, when, when you start with a K-Pox bevacizumab type regimen and then you put, put them on maintenance with K-Bev, I've had people on maintenance for years and they're working full time and no one even knows they're sick. Or they're, you know, they don't even lose their hair or anything. So um, from a quality of life standpoint, it can be uh, very advantageous to maybe hold off. Um, and, and as I said, I, I just don't understand why uh, such a slow percentage of patients are getting an EGFR inhibitor, uh, aren't getting it um, second line. So if you plan to be one and done, with one line of therapy, by all means, you should use it. If you're going to use it later, I just don't know that the case is really there. Really interesting. So, Pashtun, you also talk about the fascinating work that's been done on uh, EGFR rechallenge, so like the cricket and cave trials of cetuximab. I think it's so fast. I mean, everybody's trying to figure out whether or not we can pick up resistance mutations and what it means and lung cancer. They're all over that, for example. This is really a cool example of, uh, you know, biomarkers uh, being very, very practical. Can you kind of summarize the bottom line of what we know about rechallenge and what do you do in your own practice, Pashtun? Yeah, no, I think, uh, like you was mentioning, um, for sure, the use of CTDNA and NGS based in this particular setting and later line can um, uh, lessen the number of patients who may not benefit from this approach. You know, we just heard about the toxicity of anti GFR. Your patient who is CTDNA positive for resistance mutations will benefit not at all. That's what these Cricket, Cave, and Kronos approaches have shown. So you could argue that the progression free survival in these trials was like four months or so, and the overall survival was over a year for the liquid wild type patients or liquid uh, negative patients. 
But using CGDNA as like a triage to identify which patient you would want to consider EGFRE challenge, or for that matter, just like we talked about the TAS-102 plus BEV or some of these other uh, anti-VEGF, non-EGFR therapies are going to be available, including regorafenib as a strategy. Uh, this uh, in real world can be a, a utility of using liquid biopsy to guide that decision. So uh, one of the topics in the ASCO's uh, review there of metastatic disease was BRAF, a mutant disease. And Wells, you uh, talked about some of the new papers. Can you kind of summarize where we are right now with uh, um, anti-BRAF, with uh, BRAF mutant colorectal cancer and where you think we'll be in the next two or three years? Yeah, so I, I think the story is sort of similar to the trastuzumab tucatinib story, which is that we have a trial. This is sort of an interesting story, right? Because we, we initially had the triplet. Turned out the triplet and the doublet were quite similar. And so the doublet is what it was improved with encorafenib, it's tuximab. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself um, that um, you really didn't need the binimetinib. Um, and uh, Dr. Kopetz, uh, had, you know, he's been really leading the way in this, in this whole area, starting with cell lines, you know, way back when. Um, has shown that the the patients do have a, a better quality of life versus uh, you know chemotherapy, so I think um, uh, you know that's reassuring that we're not only uh, improving survival length but we're also improving quality of life, and then this will be moving into the uh, first line setting um, in combination with with chemotherapy, and it looks like it's safe when it's combined with with chemotherapy. So um, so that's one thing that's happening is it's moving to an earlier line in combination, very similar to the HER2 story we had earlier. And then the other is what about combining it with immune therapy? And so Van Morris, uh, who uh, works with Scott and others at, at MD Anderson, is leading that trial looking at the role of nivolumab added to engrafenib and cetuximab um, because it does seem to be an inflamed tumor type to see whether that um, adds to the efficacy. So I'd say that's kind of where it's the field's kind of bifurcating their way. What's the, what's the role of the combination with immune therapy, and can we move it to the first-line setting? So, Pashtun, any comments about this? And also first-line therapy of uh, BRAF disease. I mean, we didn't talk about any papers this year. I'm curious in general how you're approaching first-line therapy right now. Any situations where you'd use targeted therapy in the first line, Pashtun? I think um, outside of a trial, uh, obviously we have to try chemo first before we move to uh, the encorafenib with cetuximab or pantomab strategy. But at least knowing the molecular status and knowing this as an FDA-approved option allows us to maybe pivot to this earlier, especially in an elderly patient where uh, neuropathy sometimes can be an issue from ongoing fall fox. And uh, so that might be an indication to kind of uh, pivot early. But Outside of a trial um, like the Breakwater, which is ongoing, as well as uh, Anchor, which was like a, uh, the beacon with the MEK inhibitor uh, first line chemo free regimen, um, it, it's more so uh, it's in the second line or beyond. What about uh, chemo uh, choice? We were talking about the uh, ASCO paper in triplets versus doublets. Do you think about triplets just based on BRAF status? I do lean towards it as long as it's somebody who has a good performance status and no other comorbidities limiting it because, of, of course, these patients have a worse prognosis and triplet, uh, and even in the original uh, TRIBE study in the subset analyses, uh, this was one of the subsets that the triplet was more favored towards, but of course, that may or may not be always feasible if somebody has other comorbidities uh, in the geriatric patient population where you will see the uh, we'll see, we'll see a significant number of patients as well. So this is a slide to well so showed in terms of where things are heading. And you know, over there on the left, you see even adjuvant. Any thoughts, so Wells? Uh, yeah, so those trials are, are launching, and we'll just have to see. You know, sometimes we get surprised. I think cetuximab being a great example where we all thought that was going to work adjuvantly. And it's interesting you know, to me, the, the Fulfirinox story with BRAF was so it, – it's a it's classic kind of publication bias issue where – it sort of first came out, they saw this big effect, everyone kind of hopped on board, kind of reminds me of double biologics. I'm showing how old I am, but uh, remember the, the, the days of double biologics, Neil. Pashtin was too young, of course, at the time. But anyways. Um, I don't even remember you know, that. <laughs> I think that one went out of my head. Double <laughs> biologics? I, have, I don't remember, remember that. Yeah, you mean EG, EGFR and BEV? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes, well, yeah, I forgot a, half of what I ever knew anyhow. So 
yeah, yeah, wow, that was cool. a big, big thing uh, when I was coming up, and and um, turn you know based on a phase two trial, and then it just turned out it didn't pan out. It probably caused harm. When they did a subsequent analysis on fulfirinox and BRAF, it, it, there was no effect. Um, so we went from this incredibly uh, impressive forest plot from an initial publication that got a lot of press to a follow-up publication that showed no difference but didn't get press. And, and so peop, many people don't know that. So I still hear that a lot about fulfirinox and BRAF, and I, I, I don't think it panned out that they did some follow-up publications and there's no, there's no difference. So Dr. Kumar in the chat room says he's actually used the double biologic in a patient who had a great response. Of course, that's a trial of one, but well, interesting anyhow. So well, I was say the, uh, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, they, they say the plural of anecdote isn't data. <laughs> uh, so the data would say that uh, it, 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 they don't work. Uh, obviously, there's anecdotes of people having responses to things, yeah. So, uh, Pashtun and Wells, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back in about a week and uh, check out one of our programs at the ONS meeting or at the AUA meeting. Be safe, say well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Pashtun. Thanks, Wells. Thank you. Thank you.